on behalf of the cmr group of institutions and the board of management i deem it a great pleasure to welcome all of you to uh, this august international conference on trade law lot of things have gone within the wto it is almost 27 27 years and 2 months since the wto came into force the wto came with an objective to improve the standards of living of the poor people of the developing countries and increase trade relationship and protect the interests of goods and services but then lot of things have come in in the past 27 years and whether this has benefited to the poor people or the poorest of the poor in the developing countries or not we have been discussing this at various forums but then there are a few issues uh, in which we should brood over and discuss so that it will be more effective in the years ahead one fundamental point which i just intend to bring home happened to be the russia and ukraine war many have felt at the international level that it is going to bring down international trade the wto had forecast that the trade level is supposed to come down but then it did not as per the wto estimates it has gone up by 3% that means people wherever they are states when they function wherever they be interested in protecting the trade interested in protecting and helping the poorest of the people anywhere now there are other issues as well which we will be discussing in the course of seminar but it is my duty to welcome to all the dignitaries on behalf of the cmr group of institutions i welcome our chairman beloved chairman dr k c ramurthy who is we have been able to carry out several programs uh, in this institution especially in the school of legal speaker in professor raj bhalla a living legend especially in the area of trade law his contribution to international trade and the wto is immense and being appreciated world over when we approached him he whole heartedly accepted our invitation and agreed to deliver the keynote address sir on behalf of the chairman and on behalf of the governing council and all on behalf of every one of us we welcome you to this august function we have a uh, two three distinguished guests here and it is my duty to welcome all of them all of them will be here as resource persons and they will be speaking to us one of them is dr sandeep apat who is a professor of law specialized in international trade and space law working as a professor at the national university of university of judicial sciences calcutta sir we welcome you and we are honored to have you here we have peter uh, professor peter melanzik sir on behalf of the group of institutions i welcome you we have uh, our registrar dr pravin we welcome you sir and i welcome on behalf of the university all the delegates who are present here all the resource persons who are here with us and all the students participants and the paper presenters i wish you good luck and success thank you very much thank you sir for enlightening us with the details i now request our honorable chairman dr k c ramamurthy former ips officer former member of parliament rajya sabha chairman cmr group of institutions cmr university to deliver the presidential address good morning good morning uh, ladies and gentlemen it gives me immense pleasure to be part of this international conference it's my privilege to welcome and recognize the presence of professor rajballa professor sandeep abat professor dr peter malansak 
and other distinguished professors, participants, ladies and gentlemen. CMR University, Bangalore, is committed to the integration of enterprising initiatives and creative programs in the curricular activity, transcending conventional academic orientation to inculcate within students a vibrant and more realistic outlook towards life and a career. In our ardent pursuit of this unique objective, all schools of CMR University continue to organize international conferences on new and emerging areas. In furtherance of its vision of providing a learning forum for scholars interested in varied areas and study and practice, CMR University School of Legal Studies is committed to organize international conferences and to host legal luminaries of international trade law and afford scholars and practitioners a platform to discuss and deliberate on various contemporary legal issues and trends relating to this field. CMR University School of Legal Studies inaugurated its first international conference on current challenges in aviation space in 2019, followed by the International Conference on Aviation Law in 2020. It followed by the International Conference on Emerging Trends in International Trade Law in 2020, 2021, and the International Space Law Conference in 2022. In keeping with this academic tradition, CMR University School of Legal Studies, through its Center for International Legal Studies, is organizing this international conference dedicated to international trade laws today. India's future lies in strengthening liberal democracy and its institutions, as mentioned by our Honorable uh, Dean, as it is essential for achieving economic growth. It goes to the credit of Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi and his government for bringing out a turnaround in countries export policies, programs, through sustained trade reforms during the last few years. Despite the adverse global economic situation, India is among the few emerging economies which had escaped the worst of the adverse external environment and pandemic situation. Indian success in trade is mainly because of concerted efforts to promote Make in India, push in foreign direct investment, particularly in export-oriented industries, ease of doing business, digital India and skill India. India being the world's fastest growing economy, the government has implemented several measures, including reversing the inverted import duty to take advantage of the green shoots in the country's export. I look forward to listening to the wise words and experts from the expert speakers from around the globe in today's conference. I wish to congratulate the team led by Professor Subramanya in organizing this unique conference. I'm sure the take home from this conference will be great. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We now have with us Professor Raj Palla to deliver the keynote address on the challenges and opportunities for India in a fragmented world trading system. Professor Palla holds a Juris Doctor degree from Harvard University and serves as a Brennison Distinguished Professor at the University of Kansas. He is a member of England's Royal Society for Asian Affairs, Council on Foreign Relations, the American Law Institute, Fellowship for Catholic Scholars, and All India Law Teachers Congress. Professor Bhalla practiced international banking law at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York 
which twice granted him the President's Award for Excellence. At the New York Federation, he represented the United States in international wire transfer negotiations at the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law and dealt with the legal issues in the largest financial market and was actively involved in international banking law enforcement, including the infamous scandal involving the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. His specific work had also earned him a letter of commendation from the State Department. I now invite Professor Raj Palla to deliver the keynote address. Excellent. All right. So in part one of my remarks, I'll define what I mean by fragmentation. And I'll suggest to you that there are three dimensions of fragmentation. Russia's war in Ukraine, which began a year ago today. The Sino-American trade war, which began in March 2018. And the longstanding post-colonial, post-partition war against social injustice, which includes a war on poverty. And in the second part of my brief remarks, I'll identify what the challenges and opportunities are for India, given this threefold fragmentation. Now, the argument or the thesis of my keynote address is this. Given the three fragmentations, the three wars going on, Russia, China, and social injustice, the opportunity for India is to emerge as the world's most economically significant and politically respected developing nation, but only if India can meet the challenge of truly and fully realizing its potential as the world's largest free market democracy and the world's most religiously pluralistic country. Simply put, for India to be the leader in trade of the developing world in the eyes of the developed and developing world, India has to be, in the most authentic sense, what it is stereotypically considered, and that's the world's largest free market democracy and tolerant nation. Bereft of global leadership, Indian leadership can defragment the three fragmentations. Now, first, part one, what do we mean by fragmentation? The shorter Oxford English Dictionary tells us that this noun connotes breaking or separating into parts or fragments, forming new or individual units. And we have three types of fragmentation, parts, breaking apart in the world trading system. We have first Russia's violent war against Ukraine, what Pope Francis has rightly called, quote, a macabre regression of humanity that makes him and all of us suffer and cry, and also has barbarous, barbarously bombed the international trade system. Once upon a time after the January 1st, 1995, birth of the WTO, what mattered to businesses and governments and consumers was litigating anti-dumping cases or getting market access for goods and services or protecting IP rights or entering into FTAs. But now international trade law is really about navigating sanctions against Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, about policing supply chains to root out forced labor from Xinjiang. Uh, forget about synergistic win-win wealth generating deals for clients. We're now looking at splintered zero-sum games of avoiding criminal or civil penalties from the US Treasury Department, measures against specially designated nationals, or from the Commerce Department concerning the entity list. And the theory of peace through trade is broken too, given this war in Ukraine. The second fragmentation is America's trade war against China. This is manifestly an international trade war. In March 2018, tariffs that still remain in place on upwards of $300 billion worth of goods 
going through four waves, one, two, three, four list A of section 301 tariffs, basically 25% tariffs on about two thirds of all imports into the United States from China still remain. And the tariffs have become also a series of non-tariff barriers as we've seen both the Trump and Biden administrations expand the trade war amidst Chinese countermeasures to include an array of weapons uh, such as uh, delisting Chinese companies, taking action against Chinese military industrial complex companies. And as I indicated, the measures have been met more from Beijing by tit for tat than by an authentic effort to resolve the underlying differences. So that's the second fragmentation. And the third fragmentation is the war against social injustice, including poverty. That's a hallmark of colonialism and post-colonialism. And it's so well understood across the Indian subcontinent. And the subcontinent has produced so many great campaigners against it including Gandhiji, who's admired across the world for nonviolently fighting social injustice. And they, the, authors of, the author of India's constitution, Dr. B.B. Ambedkar, also widely admired for his fight against social injustice. India's Nobel Prize winning economist, Amartya Sen, points out in Development as Freedom, his 1999 book, that The social injustices are not just income poverty, but their capability deprivations, the life under a tyrannical or an authoritarian regime that robs a person of full participation in the political and social life of a community, the systematic social deprivation, including the lack of public facilities that rob people of the freedom to enjoy organized arrangements, functional education rule of law, an intolerance that's based on ethnicity, gender, race, religion, sexual orientation. All of these are marginalizations and they form fragmentations that we're living with in the world trading system. So what then are the challenges and opportunities for India amidst these three types of fragmentations? Well, first, how can India maybe defragment a bit the Russian war in Ukraine? What should India's international trade laws and policies be to prosper amidst what is this lethal proxy war between its former ally, the Soviet Union, and the Western alliance? Well, here are some suggestions, and I realize they may be controversial. Not everyone will agree, but at least as the thought leadership that CMR University has provided, perhaps these suggestions will stimulate discussion. Suggestion number one is to follow Singapore, follow the United Nations Sec- Secretary General. There is a real choice between siding with an aggressor state and siding with an invaded state. It's not a difficult moral decision. Singapore made the right choice. It sided with Ukraine. It didn't cling to a fig leaf of neutrality. And yesterday we heard the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, speak of the Russian invasion, that it's an affront to our collective conscience and a violation of the UN Charter and international law. 100,000 Russians and 100,000 Ukrainian troops have been killed. Upwards of 7,200 civilians are dead. 13 million are refugees. So suggestion number one is to think, why did Singapore make the decision it did? Why did the Secretary General say what he said? Second suggestion is to remember where India's long-term security interests lie. India's argument for neutrality goes beyond its energy interests in getting oil and natural gas from Russia. And it goes beyond its long-standing Cold War era ties with the Soviet Union. As the New York Times put it a few days ago, as tensions increase along India's border with China, experts have said that India does not feel it can risk its relationship with Russia, a key source for weapons for India. But that rationale is ever less persuasive. 
Russia itself is short of weapons. In contrast to before its military adventure, it is no longer a net arms exporter. Russia is trying to restock itself from wherever it can, including Iran and North Korea. That's a sign of weakness. And Russian weaponry has proven to perform poorly on the battlefield. Russia is not a reliable source of weaponry for India, neither in volume nor in quality. India's government procurement needs are better satisfied with the US and its allies. And as for offsetting China, Russia is practically aligned with China on Ukraine. If India thinks Russia will help China keep it at bay on the line of actual control, that's wishful thinking. Russia will not pressure China on the LAC when China is tilted in Russia's favor in Ukraine. A third suggestion, don't get frozen out of Euro-American markets. I've got a new article coming out in Trade Law and Development on the waves and waves of trade sanctions the US and the allies have put on Russia. I spent all day today on the new US sanctions and allied sanctions um, to deal with uh, evasion and to deal with repurpose, repur repurposing of goods. To flout US and allied sanctions is to jeopardize the prospects of Indian businesses, to run afoul of them and get placed on the entity list or the SDN list or both will hurt Indian businesses. And basically the choice Indian businesses are going to face is to do business with a small ecosystem of Russia, Iran, and North Korea, or a broad, deep, liquid Euro-Atlantic economy of 800 million high purchasing power consumers. There's no business choice there. What about the second type of defragmentation? How can India deal amidst the Sino-American trade war? What should India's international trade laws and policies be? Here are a couple of suggestions. First, focus on rules of origin. Forge a make in India industrial policy that outcompetes with the Chinese made in China 2025 policy, but that's also not protectionist and encourages trade and foreign direct investment. Ensure that merchandise is not made in China, even if it has some inputs from China, so that it can qualify for the best trade treatment without sanctions or export controls. And to help alleviate poverty, possibly consider a labor value content rule of origin like that in the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement concerning autos and auto parts. A second suggestion, think about sensitive sectors. India can reconfigure its subsidies so that they're green box and or non-specific and comply with the WTO AG and SCM agreements. And it can remember that industrial policy is not designed to protect a privileged few domestic monopolies or oligopolies. It's not designed to make India safe for plutocracy. Industrial policy is about thoughtfully selecting a limited number of sensitive sectors in India's economy that have major employment implications like autos, auto parts, and agriculture. A third suggestion is to friend shore. Make in India supply chains do not need to be all in India. They can be friend shored too. That's what the US is doing in the CHIPS Act. A fourth suggestion, apply to accede to the CPTPP and develop ambitious FTAs with the EU, UK, and the US. And those ambitious FTAs include an agreement which is not an FPTA, and that's IPEF. So far, India is resisting joining all four pillars of IPEF. In particular, it's resisting joining the market access pillar. But that is where a lot of the action really is. On the third type of defragmentation, what can India do to help defragment the fragmentation caused by social injustice? Well, here are a couple of ideas. First, focus on what Amartya Sen calls economic facilities. It's not a question of everything all at once now. 
an FTA need not be zero sum either or. It can be both and. It can be win-win. So that's thanks to carefully crafted staging categories that allow time for adjustment, like phasing in duty-free quota-free treatment across five or 10 years and maybe even back-end loading it um, in a staging category. Focus also on political and social freedoms, like Chapter 23 of TPP and USMCA, which bar discrimination in employment against women and against LGBTQ plus persons. Don't run away from those issues. If India expects to be a leading voice in the developed and developing world, if it expects to sign commercially meaningful free trade agreements with major players like the EU, Canada, and the US, it cannot ignore those social injustice issues of marginalized populations. It's a conversation that India has to have internally as well as externally. So to conclude, defragmentation requires leadership. Where does India stand amidst fragmented wartime world trade? Is it going to continue to accept criticism that it's less than enthusiastic about positions against Russia and China? Is it going to cling to multilateralism when the WTO is moribund? Or is it going to take up the mantle of leadership and get off the fence on some key issues? That's the opportunity for India to get off the fence, move forward, assume the mantle of leadership. We've seen India do that before. India was a founding member, a contracting party, a founding contracting party of GATT under Panditji. It was a leader of the non-aligned movement. It shaped the Uruguay Round agenda. It pressed for green box reform on public stock holding for food security purposes. But to continue that trajectory of leadership, India is going to have to take, as Henry Kissinger would put it, who was not admittedly the best friend of India, take India to a place that it has not been before because the status quo amidst this fragmentation is not sustainable. With that, let me conclude my remarks. Thank you so much for your attention. I apologize for the um, earlier technical hiccups and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, sir, for having shared your thoughts and views. Professor Bhalla will now be taking questions. Participants may post their queries using the chat box. The session will be moderated by Ms. Nidhi, Assistant Professor, CMR University, School of Legal Studies. Thank you, Mara. And thank you so much, Professor Bhalla, for your insightful words. I request the participants to kindly put their questions in the chat box so that Professor Bhalla can address the same. I request the participants to kindly put their questions in the chat box. Please don't be shy. Any questions or comments are welcome. And the longer you take to put them, the later it gets here in Kansas City. So the sleepier I'm going to become. So I can get you better answers sooner. All right, so we have two questions here. First question is from Dr. Vijay Praneshwaran. The question is, choosing US and West over Russia could be fatal since US cannot be trusted. To a certain, ex uh, to a certain extent, Russia can be, oh, I think the question is not yet complete, but I think Professor Bhalla could understand the sense of it. Sir, would you like to address it? Yes, I'd be happy to, and thank you for the question. And I do understand where that's coming from. I mean, I 
started traveling and, and spending a lot of time in India during the Cold War. And I understand India's historic um, uh, ties to the former Soviet Union. And in many ways, Russia, the Soviet Union was an easy ally. It didn't ask for quid pro quos the way the US did in the Cold War. But I think that Cold War mentality has changed. And I think what I would focus on in terms of trusting the United States to the extent we can trust any uh, country in international relations is on the common values. Obviously, President Zelensky would have a very different view um, uh, of who can be trusted. Um, and if, if India, like uh, Singapore, uh, and, and we've seen some remarkably uh, wonderful statements from um, the Singaporean leadership, um, sees the commonality of the values that we don't want to see small countries invaded, uh, we want to respect territorial integrity, um, then uh, there's a basis for trust. But I again, go back to the business case. Um, when you look at the most comprehensive sanctions against a major country in human history, because that's what these sanctions are. And that's what we do at Denton's every day, sanctions practice to help countries navigate them or get out of trouble with them. You don't want Indian businesses to be hit with them. It's one of the worst things. Earlier, we heard about the prosperity that India has enjoyed in the global trading system. Well, one way to cut off some of that prosperity is to um, run afoul of the sanctions. Um, so I would again, you know, think about the reality of the, the, the convergence of values and the reality of what it's like to navigate sanctions if you run afoul of them. All right, sir, we have one more question here from Dr. Neetu. What is the role of WTO in present scenario of Ukraine and Russia war? So the question is the role of WTO in present scenario of Ukraine and Russia war. Well, it's played very little. Uh, actually, there was a case uh, before uh, the invasion of Ukraine uh, that many of you may be familiar with involving uh, the GATT Article 21 national security um, defense, which is one of the rare times, if not the only one, that it was used successfully uh, involving traffic and transit where um, uh, Russia defended a case against uh, brought by the Ukraine uh, when the Ukraine said that Russia was blocking goods coming across Russian territory from uh, Eastern stand countries. And because the um, phrase in GATT Article 21 about uh, war and international emergency was interpreted to cover the scenario because there was a conflict, violent conflict going on, um, Russia was able to defend its um, obstruction of traffic and transit. But other than that, um, it is not the role of the WTO um, to really engage in much in the way of conflict resolution, uh, only indirectly insofar as we have a, uh, a, a peace through trade uh, uh, idea. Um, again, remember the functions of the WTO are to negotiate trade treaties. It's a negotiating forum. Uh, it's an adjudicatory forum, somewhat moribund now without an appellate body. It's a research and statistics uh, area. Uh, which mimics what other governments, what governments do and what investment banks do. Um, and finally, it's a trade policy review mechanism to kind of check uh, countries. But in terms of actually uh, working on uh, conflict resolution, uh, the WTO is not an organization you hear about. Thank you, sir. We have one more question. What's your view over the probability of a recession in 2023? This is a question from Vamsi Ganesh. Well, I want to caveat my answer by saying I'm not an economist, so I'm, I'm really going to just pass on what you, you may already have heard. I, I think the consensus view uh, at the Federal Reserve in the U.S. is that at least as far as the U.S. goes, um, it will be a there will be some kind of recession or slowdown it will not be as severe as was predicted, say, uh, in April of 2022, thanks to the uh, successive rounds of high um, uh, interest rate hikes, which are going to continue in the range of 25 to 50 basis points. Um, so, I, But other than that, to say it may be a, a 
a slow recession, a soft landing kind of, a, a soft landing and, and less severe. Uh, I think I would turn that one over more to, to economists. All right, sir, there's a question from Parvati K. How does non-transparent or unpredictable regulatory and tariff policies affect trade of India? Uh, well, it affects it in two ways, perception and reality. The perception among many non-Indian businesses, and I would include even NRI businesses, uh, is that India is a difficult place in which to do business because of exactly what was mentioned in the question, non-transparency, unpredictable policy changes, um, unpredictable tariff shifts. Um, that's the perception. However, I think, as was pointed out earlier, um, the government uh, uh, of, of Prime Minister Modi has to be given a lot of credit for addressing um, the, uh, directly um, the problems of non-transparency and uh, regulatory uncertainty and trying its best uh, in a difficult climate to make India uh, an easier uh, and better place to do business. Um, I think uh, uh, that message is clear in the central government. Uh, in the provincial governments, though, in state and local governments, uh, sub-central governments, uh, there are still problems with um, non-transparency and um, getting permits to do businesses, to, to open factories, to get land acquisition. Because as we know, under India's constitution, um, some of the um, work that needs to be done for a foreign company to trade or do business in India is going to need to be done with a sub-central government. And that's where it can be more difficult than dealing with uh, 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 Delhi. All right, thank you, sir. We have a comment and also a question from Mr. Brett Williams in the chat box for sir. Uh, it is with regards to WTO, and I guess Sir has already addressed. However, I request Sir to kindly refer to the chat box because it's a big question, and I would want to know if you want to address the question or not. It is again with regards to WTO. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to try and address, and I'm very thankful uh, to it for from my um, dear friend and colleague, um, uh, Professor Brett Williams, um, and he he actually would would be an expert on this. Um, yes, uh, why is the WTO moribund? Um, well, one reason is he puts in the question is um, that there is a split opinion or many opinions on the extent to which there should be special and differential treatment or whether there should be any at all. The Trump administration basically um, uh, took the view that we're not interested in, in uh, granting any more special and differential treatment. Um, on the other hand, um, many developing countries have said, look, the special and differential treatment coming out of the Uruguay round was very poor. It was really just in the form of um, uh, de minimis levels, uh, thresholds, or uh, phase in, phase out periods. Um, and so uh, with that view, which India has taken, um, India has, has been criticized for being obstructionist um, in in um, uh, demanding uh, more and more special and differential treatment. Um, and uh, likewise, um, China's insistence on being considered a developing country um, has um, exacerbated um, tensions. Um, I think um, uh, another reason, of course, the WTO is moribund is in its, uh, that's that's all on the S&D treatment. That's in the adjudic, that's in the, um, negotiating functions, um, uh, negotiating form. In the adjudicatory function, I think uh, the blame pretty clearly lies, and I've said this in writing, with the United States and its uh, uh, insistence on one very narrow way of judicial interpretation, and that's textualism. Um, and we can go into that if you like, but basically the U.S. won't approve any um, judicial uh, any nominee to the WTO appellate body that basically wouldn't get on um, the U.S. Supreme Court under a, a Republican administration because they want um, very narrow textualists um, who they perceive are not judicially active. 
Um, and that's really killed the WTO appellate body. No one else, by the way, I've talked to lots of Supreme Court justices in many countries, no one else has such a narrow view of, of, of judicial interpretation as does the US. Thank you so much, sir. We move to the next question and the question is from Mr. Satish. What would be the future of globalization in international trade? COVID brought the world converts towards self-sufficiency. Right now, I would say it's looking like fragmentation, uh, meaning that um, rather than multilateral trade liberalization, what we're seeing is um, supply chain reconfiguration, um, largely out of China, um, decoupling, if you will, and, and, and of course, out of Russia. Uh, the US has basically just uh, banned uh, Russian aluminum, for example. Uh, when that includes Rusal, which accounts for about 6% of the world's aluminum supply, um, and, and onshoring and friendshoring. And that's the opportunity for India too. So in other words, instead of looking at 164 WTO member countries and exporting and getting uh, MFN treatment in those countries um, and, and sourcing inputs from the cheapest cost suppliers, companies and countries are sourcing inputs from the most secure suppliers, even if they're the, not the cheapest, um, and uh, looking to um, uh, make sure that they're not running afoul again of, of, of sanctions uh, or export controls. So that's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reconfiguration of supply chains and a fragmentation away from um, a multilateral export-oriented outlook. That's what we see businesses you know, doing. They don't come to you and say, where's the cheapest uh, cost um, supplier of a chip for a refrigerator? They say, what's the most reliable and secure um, supplier of a chip? Thank you so much, sir. There are still a lot many questions, but I think we should leave the questions for the upcoming sessions. Thank you so much for your beautiful answers addressed so wisely that I think everybody has got a lot of insight on the topic. Uh, now I hand it over to Maria for the next session. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful answers. Thank you, participants, for the thought-provoking questions. We now have with us Professor Dr. Sandeepa Bhatt, to deliver the inaugural address on Atma Nirbhar Bharat Abhyan and International Trade Law. Professor Bhatt is a professor of law and director of the Center for Aviation and Space Laws at the National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata. He has the experience of researching on five major research projects sponsored by World Bank, the ISRO, and the Ministry of Justice, among others. He is also a member of the American Society for International Law, the American Academy for Space Law, and the International Institute of Space Law, France. Having presented over 100 papers in national and international conferences, including the coveted International Aeronautical Congress, he is a member of the Indian Space Research Organization's Expert Advisory Group for drafting the National Space Act for India. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can you enable me to share screen? No, I have unmuted myself. Can't hear me. Hello. Yes. One second, sir. One second, I'm doing. Can you hear me now? Okay, we can. We can hear. You. Okay. Can you enable me to share the screen? So yes, sir. Now you can do. It is done. Right. I think my screen is visible. Can someone confirm? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Very good morning to all of you uh, from India. Of course, I know that actually it's night at the United States. Uh, and it's a great privilege for me to share the session once again with Professor Raj Bhala, so whom uh, I think whose work we all of us consider a Bible 
for studying uh, international trade law. Uh, I have the privilege of carrying forward the second and the third limb of his presentation in terms of uh, fragmentation. Uh, my my is more focused in terms of his second limb, to be very precise, on the Make in India Initiative aspect, which he has basically touched upon. Uh, before uh, starting my presentation, I would also like to start with the caveat that uh, this presentation is purely from an academic perspective. I'm also looking only from the perspective of ability, and it has nothing to do with my political affiliation. So uh, I have always been actually a person outside of my party affiliation. So therefore, it is nothing to do with that. It is purely from academic uh, perspective. All of us are aware of the fact that uh, every country likes to protect its economy. Of course, it's a kind of a duty of every sovereign nation. And uh, even though we are parties to the, the WTO law, we have committed for actually the trade liberalization, so on and so forth. Still, we have a protectionist mind. Inside, we have a protectionist mind, especially because we need to protect our economy. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 has got a severe effect on the world economy. India, with the second highest number of infections and third highest number of deaths, and also so many measures in terms of actually preventing the spread of COVID-19, had got a lot of toll on the economy. And in order to revive the economy, we saw the launch of Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan, 2020, actually, uh, President uh, Narendra Modi has went for Atmanirbhar Bharat, self-reliant India. Under the self-reliant India program, several production-linked incentives were also brought in. And in fact, if you look into the, uh, the proclamation which has been made, or maybe the ministry's website and all, it is very clear that this production linked the initiatives which are brought under Atmanirbhar Bharat are carrying forward the legacy of Make in India initiative. And in fact, the Make in India started in December 2014. The program uh, was launched. Uh, so, these uh, production linked the initiatives are all carrying forward the crux of the Make in India initiative for the purpose of ensuring that the India would become kind of a global matching hub. Under Make in India, several schemes were actually brought in. Different kind of financial supports were given for uh, different industries. Uh, and of course, as Professor Rajbala has rightly pointed out, we need to be careful about the subsidies which are prohibited under the SEM agreement. Unfortunately, some of them what are given under the Make in India fall within the ambit of the prohibited subsidies, which I'll just discuss a little later. So under the Make in India initiative, we wanted to have India as a kind of a production, global production hub. And also we went for what is called as local for local, right? So taking more local products instead of actually importing those products, giving focus more in terms of actually the locally produced product. So a campaign has been made under the Make in India initiative. If you look into the Make in India initiative website, you can find these things, whatever is there in the slide. I have picked the two picks out of that actually. First part of that, the one which is in the left hand side, shows the different areas wherein actually the Make in India initiative contribution is being done, like automobile, automobile components, aviation, biotechnology, chemicals, etc. In different sectors, the support which has been provided. The right part of the slide, I have taken one example. Of course, my maybe my uh, areas of aviation and space. So of course, uh, so one of them I have taken here, aviation. You can find towards the end of the slide that even in the 2022-2023 budget, there has been an allocation which has been made as a financial support to the aviation industry. Of course, the total grant is more than 10,000 uh, crores, but for the industry, there is a grant of 120 crore which has been actually given for a three financial years. So for three financial years, it has been provided under the, uh, under the Make in India initiative. 
which is also on the basis of uh, the production linked initiative scheme, which I said under the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiya. However, if you look at what has been given under the Make in India initiative, it has been hit uh, before the WTO panel. There, there is a case, United States has taken us to uh, the WTO panel, India export related measures of 2019, wherein multiple financial supports, whatever has been given by the government of India, on the basis of five schemes, I have mentioned those schemes therein, export oriented unit schemes, export promotion capital goods scheme, SEZ scheme, special economic zone uh, scheme, duty free imports and exports scheme, scheme merchandise exports from India scheme. <clears throat> These were actually challenged before the WTO panel by the United States, contending that there were certain kind of subsidies or certain kind of financial contributions which go against Article 3 of the SCM, the prohibited subsidies. We tried to invoke Article 27 exception of the SCM agreement, uh, wherein on the one hand, there is an exception for less developed countries, the least developed countries. There is also an exception available for the developing countries for a period of eight, eight years. For a period of eight years, it was available for the developing countries. We could have granted actually certain kind of export subsidies, even though there is a commitment for reduction of that. There was also Annex 7, Annex 7B. Especially Annex 7B provides a certain developing countries an additional window period for filing any any action against them. Some of the developing countries who did not have actually the economic development at a very high level, so they were given an additional window. And uh, Annex 7B says that uh, countries, including India, there are multiple countries who are mentioned therein, the time when the GNP per capita reaches uh, $1,000 per year, $1,000 per annum, from that particular point in time, uh, prohibited subsidies need to be completely eliminated. <clears throat> so, uh, India had a kind of a leeway. Uh, initially, for developing countries, Article 27 mentions about eight years, and Annex 8, uh, 7B basically speaks about actually for certain countries until they reach a particular threshold, right? $1,000 uh, per annum uh, GNP per capita. So, until that time, there would not be any action taken uh, against them. So, there was a graduating period. Unfortunately, India has graduated that already in 2016. Actually, we have uh, graduated. But despite that, we contended this as an exception. Special and differential treatment under 27 should continue because, according to India, this exception should be applicable for another eight years. 2016, another eight years, still 2024. So, so we were arguing. But the plain text of the XCM agreement did not support this. Because it was focusing more in terms of developing countries having eight years window period starting from 1995, first year of 1995. So it should have been over by 2003. Only action against the developing countries mentioned under 7B were actually postponed. Suppose if any action is supposed to be taken or maybe any countermeasure is supposed to be taken, it's after they graduate. That's what was actually the understanding, uh, of course, the understanding of the panel. And that is the very reason why the panel ruled against India panel said that there are different kind of export subsidies which are prohibited under uh, Article 3 of the SAM agreement and they need to be actually taken off by India within 90 days. They also specified the time. Within 90 days, we have to actually remove all those kind of uh, the measures. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, India has appealed against the decision and uh, appellate body is dysfunctional. From December 2019, actually, we don't have a functioning uh, the appellate body. So the decision is hung at the WTO appellate body level. But this doesn't mean that we can sit tight and relaxed. Panel has already shown us a concern that yes, we have already graduated and then we should take off these kind of uh, uh, subsidies. So we might may have to think in terms of it, number one. Number two, there is also another interesting thing. Uh, the, I have given an example of the aviation sector financial support which spreads over to three financial years. And the third financial year ends by 2025. Even if we go by Indian argument, we, I mean, additional eight years, even if we say that, I mean, I don't think that that is permissible, but still, even if you go by the Indian argument, 
additional eight years would uh, get over by 2024. It won't stretch to 2025. So by virtue of that, all those uh, export subsidies which are hit by Article 3 becomes illegal under the WTO regime. So that's why I completely agree with Professor Rajbala that we have to be careful in granting the financial support and we need to ensure that we are not going to actually go against the WTO commitments, especially after committing uh, at the international level. Added to that, one more interesting thing you can find in the uh, uh, website. Uh, so there is a separate website created for uh, this, which provides Atmanirbhar Bharat pledge. Anyone can take this uh, pledge for supporting the, uh, the mission. And there's also a certificate, all those things. If you can do that, that's a screenshot of actually the, uh, the website. In the back of which I have discussed, Make India Initiative or the production linked initiatives, whatever we have uh, uh, discussed until now. Atmanirbhar Bharat seems to be a kind of a program oriented more in terms of actually going for local products as against the imported products. So a government is creating a situation amongst actually the multiple players in the country, wherein we have to go for more and more domestic product rather than imported product. But my question is that, wouldn't it fall within the ambit of the GATT situation compliance? Article 23.1c, if we can actually go through the GATT, uh, there are three kind of a complaints which are permissible under Article 23, a violation complaint, a non-violation complaint, and a situation complaint. Both violation and non-violation complaints do require a measure taken by the state, a specific measure taken by the state. It might violate a GATT obligation or might not violate a GATT obligation, resulting in nullification or impairment. Action is possible. But a third limb, which has not been invoked till today, has been a situation it says existence of any other situation, even in those circumstances, if the state has failed to handle those situations, right, which is not conducive for the international trade, which results in nullification or impairment of a benefit to any of the, uh, the countries, the WTO members, then they can bring in a situation complaint under Article 23 c Under the GATT regime, there have been invocation of situation complaint. Few of the countries have invoked actually. So we can uh, refer to uh, European recourse to Article 23. Uh, and there was also an instance where the France brought in certain measures. UK basically said that it could fall into the situation complaint. Like that, there are multiple instances wherein it has been argued or it has been put forward. But there is no decision under the GATT. No, no panel has decided on the situation complaint, as per my understanding. Right? Uh, Professor Rajbala may correct me if at all there is any uh, other case. I don't think there is any case decided by the panel. And at the WTO level, it has also not been invoked by any uh, party till today. However, we cannot sit quiet and we cannot presume that there would not be any kind of a situation complaint. There is every possibility, especially because a kind of a situation is being created wherein we are advocating more for the local product as against the imported product. So we might fall prey of Article 23, uh, 1C as the first country. Finally, let me uh, just, I mean, it's a passing reference to the third uh, part of uh, Professor Rajbala's presentation. What is this self-reliance? So we are basically speaking about Atmanirbhar or self-reliant uh, India. Yes, of course, absolutely required. There is no doubt. But for industries, if we are actually promoting the business, ease of doing business, as we are basically speaking about, I don't think ease of doing business can be uh, ensured by the financial incentive. Rather, it should be by virtue of ensuring the legal and administrative certainty. We need to have proper law. Right, so telling them clearly, this is the law, you need to comply with these things, this is the procedure to be followed. We need to have administrative certainty, we need to have a number of people, administrative staff, for granting licenses, supervision, whatever it may be. We need to handle corruption, bureaucracy at the administration level. So that would help our businesses better than providing them any financial incentive. Because this Financial incentive, of course, they would be, I mean, of course, actually, for if, if a particular kind of a business is worthy and they are in a position to convince the creditors, definitely everyone would be able to generate uh, uh, investments in the present day world. There is no problem in terms of the investment. A convincing business proposal would definitely get the investments. So they are not looking forward for the financial incentive from the, the government. 
rather they are looking forward for the legal and administrative certainty in terms of conducting the business let me quickly give you two examples to support my this argument right? and it was in terms of social justice rather than actually just a justice for select selective uh, first is the failed space sector reforms we have been advocating for commercialization of the space activities since 1990s in fact in 1992 we have established the anthrix corporation for the purpose of commercialization of our space i i i don't think actually there is any success of the anthrix because till very recently not even a single private player carried on the launch and return activity from it not even a single player 1992 we have established we couldn't succeed except a major litigation anthrix divorce case nothing else has happened in terms of commercialization then 2019 uh, we have established actually the new space uh, india limited again having a mandate of commercialization similar to anthrix but without mentioning what exactly is the difference between anthrix and new space india limited 2022 the last year we have also established the in space indian space promotion uh, and authorization center for licensing the private space activities so last year it has been established some uh, program happened some contracts were signed but till today you can find that only one person has used actually the launch facility of uh, sri kota to launch it but to actually test now, that's it nobody else is interested in even seeking license nobody else has applied till, till now why because we don't have a law where is the law governing actually the private space activities in india how do they know what is their liability what is the cap of liability is there an unlimited liability limited liability how do they know about it how do they know whether the licenses granted by this particular uh, agency in space would be valid or not in the future without a legal backing they might have invested and ultimately it may end up in the anthrix divorce case itself like that right so divorce corporation invested heavily in terms of space activities their orbital allocation has been cancelled considering it to be illegal so who is going to uh, invest in the space sector unless and until we have that legal certainty as uh, coupled with administrative certainty that is number one number two i told about aviation sector that is an uh, investment which is going to be done uh, 120 crores is to be invested that is for the, actually the supporting drone industry in india drone industry i would say it is not a calculated move at all because development of drones in india of course in the aviation sector there is a lot of problem in terms of handling the air traffic that's a different issue from the perspective of employment i should say it's a disaster because most of the companies are going to actually substitute the manpower with the drones now so supply of any products amazon flipkart uh, or maybe say uh, uh, twitter sorry the zomato swiggy whatever actually the different kind of uh, uh, the delivery agencies are there they are going to rely on drones now how many people are making their livelihood at present by uh, delivering these uh, the products presently unimaginable in unimaginable that many numbers of actually people are making their livelihood can the drone industry create that many employment i don't think so not even 1% of actually the number of people who are employed in actually these services so precisely because of that reason uh, i don't think actually it's a wise investment in terms of the uh, the promotion of the, the drone industry and we should consider more in terms of other sectors which are public utility services rather than actually investing in the industries industries should be more in terms of providing the legal and administrative certainty not the financial incentive most of them would be hit by the wt also so therefore i would like to say that atmanirbharatha or the self reliance should be for all and not for actually a select few that's all from my end i'm happy to take any question thank you so much thank you sir we now move on to the question and answer session moderated by ms akhila assistant professor cmi university school of legal studies the participants may post their queries in the chat box ma'am you are muted ma'am you are yeah, not audible
Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for such an intriguing uh, lecture. Um, so I, I would now open the session for question answers. We should be able to get that questions in the chat box. Uh, so professor what will be with us throughout the session so if there are any questions we'll be very happy to be taking it to professor Bhatt. Uh, now i will request maria to go ahead with the program Oh, I think there's a question now popped up. Right? Oh, there is one question um, by Mr. Uh, Satish S. How Atmanirbhar program addresses lag in the agriculture sector in terms of its contribution to GDP? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, with respect to the agricultural sector, also, there has been actually a particular portion financial incentive which has been uh, provided actually. Uh, and uh, a portion of that is also actually connected with the export oriented uh, the subsidies, as I was basically pointing, pointing it out. Only thing is that we were actually arguing it under the food security. So, over the period of time, we, we have been saying that for the purpose of food security, we can bring it within the ambit of the green box the subsidies. But still, the way in which it has been de designed at present, does not make it fall within the ambit of the green box subsidies. That is the reason why there is a concern with respect to agricultural the sector. So that's what I can point out with respect to it. Of course, as far as actually how it is addressing, yes, it is trying to provide certain kind of incentives uh, to the agricultural sector. How far actually it is going to be effective in terms of the requirement of the farmers, that's a different uh, evaluation that should be done by the economists, not by the lawyers. <laughs> Oh, okay. There is one more question. I think I can read it. Uh, would you feel uh, is a success till date? Only thing is that we have to widen its ambit. Obviously, it has been a success in terms of our economy. No doubt it about that. Uh, I started with the period that uh, my presentation is more in terms of uh, the, our commitment at the WTO level. Right? So, we have committed at the WTO level. There is actually certain requirements which need to comply with and also there is a limited compromise of sovereignty which we have done at the WTO right, by virtue of our uh, the commitment. So uh, I am not evaluating the success of Atmanirbhar Bharat in terms of actually the its contribution to Indian economy, but my evaluation has been more in terms of uh, its evaluation from the WTO's perspective. Plus the last portion has been, is it that actually contributing in terms of Atmanirbhar for everyone or is it for only actually a, a few, select few? So therefore, uh, it's not uh, in terms of actually it's a total contribution to our uh, economy. Hope that it answers uh, the question. Uh, so we may take one last question. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, between self-reliance, is a question by Dr. Vijay Pancho. Uh, between self-reliance and uh, satisfying WTO, which one should uh, India pursue? Uh, I should say both. And I think Professor Rajabha also mentioned that. Because actually, uh, both of us are not mentioning that providing financial contribution is a problem. We are not mentioning that. What we are mentioning is that we have to design it in such a way that it falls under permissive, right? It doesn't fall under actually prohibited categories. So therefore, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-actually self-reliance. There is no doubt in terms of that. Every country has to do it. But we have to design our policies in such a way that it would be consistent with the WTO regime. 
and it is very much possible only thing is that we have to apply our mind that's it like i was uh, mentioning in the prof minutes ago that professor but will be with us throughout the conference so we'll be able to take questions if there are any at a later Yeah, I will be. I will be there in the afternoon. I will be there in the afternoon session. In between, I have to attend few meetings actually. <laughs> so my university's <laughs> work is also there actually. So I will be joining uh, around one one thirty. I think I suppose actually. Right. So I will be available for any question and answer at that time. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, participants, for wonderful questions. We have now come to the end of the first session. I now request our director, Professor Dr. Vijay Pranishwaran, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Extremely grateful to Professor Raj Balla for having consented to be the chief guest and delivering the keynote address that has set the tone. Thank you very much, Professor Balla. This uh, sets the tone for the entire day. Thank you very much for joining us and always supporting in all our endeavors. Thank you very much, Professor Raj Bala. We are also extremely thankful to Professor Dr. Sandeep Abad, Professor of Law and Director of Center for Aviation and Space Laws, NUJS, who is like uh, an extended uh, faculty of uh, CMR University and uh, always uh, supporting us. He has also set the tone for uh, between uh, policies that. country or specifically india the pursues and wto maintaining a balance between both very important thank you very much professor sandeep abad for delivering the inaugural address extremely grateful to our beloved chairman dr kc ramoti ips retired former member of parliament rajya sabha chairman cmr group of institutions for presiding over the event and delivering the presidential address thank you very much sir we are also thankful to our beloved dean dr t r subramania for welcoming everyone and organizing this event the brain behind the entire event today thank you very much sir we are also thankful to all the participants who have joined us this is just the beginning the tone is set we have an entire day a long day more sessions to come hope more deliberations happen and more change of ideas happen all the best everyone thank you very much